everybody. <laughs> Got to make sure that one's done first. Okay. So, well, so I do video recordings too, so I'm a little careful about the starts. Um, well, hello, everybody. I'm Johnny Wilson. I teach at UC Santa Cruz. I'm a lecturer and teacher supervisor. And I'd like to share with you something I've been doing with my students the last couple of years, something I call lesson study protocol. And what's worthwhile about it is it's about collegial conversation, about bringing our student teachers together so they learn how to talk to each other about their teaching. So I'm going to share with you how it came about. And later on, I'll share with you some actual cases of our cases of teaching. So let me get started. Lesson study protocol came about because of the bad thing. So back in winter of 2020, we know something happened. Along the way, we were doing really great. I was visiting classrooms. Um, I was meeting with my students regularly, doing informal visits and such. And then COVID came along and we had to change our instruction. So all of our instruction at the university became remote, but then all of our student teachers instruction as well was remote mode too. And this is after they've had already had seven months, eight months of teaching in classrooms, field placement in person. So we moved to remote instruction. We moved to, we moved to remote supervision too. So the problem for me was how do I still get at the student teachers practice in ways that can support them to get better? And so I began one hour weekly meetings with each of my student teachers. And there needed to be some mechanism to have a conversation around their teaching. So they would share their remote teaching and questions of practice. And I developed a tool to help facilitate that. And I've shared this with folks over the last couple of years. And at last year's conference as well, the lesson study protocols built around the interactive supervision journal. And it's a terrible title. I think other folks have named it, given it a better name. Um, essentially what this was, was a a form that student teachers would use for each of their sessions with me. So once a week, they would complete this form. And there are three parts to this. You can see on the upper left, you can see these pictures of remote instruction. And this table was just a way to capture the ongoing everyday instruction that was happening for with the student teachers and their virtual or remote placements. So, and you can see there are links to slides, links to students' work, this is just a way to catch everyday teaching over the course of a week. The second part was focused on a case of teaching. So each student teacher would take something of the week and make it a question, a, a case, a problem of practice, which they would share with me. And then essentially that became the conversation. And this is broken up into a number of pieces. Um, the first part under the green was just setting out the case. There were questions about what was learned, what kinds of moves the student teacher did to make learning happen. And then under blue and red, there's both challenges and questions, which would stir, promote the conversation we would have to follow. And we would capture things along the way. In the lower right-hand corner, it'll make more sense when you see this um, with my student teachers in the lesson study videos I'm sharing in a few minutes. Um, I wrote down notes. And these notes became um, the focus points. Under strengths, we always start with strengths because we want to be not think about teaching as a problem, but something that teaching that we have teaching strengths that we continue to work from. And then under concer concerns areas for focus, these were all drawn from the questions and challenges from the supervision journal. And the next steps for improvement followed. Um, I often call these homework, and I usually set them out in conversation with the student teachers in two different ways. One was short-term goals, things that could be done in the next week or two that the student teacher might report back to me or I might observe through the remote teaching, just very practical. Here's something you can do in the next two weeks or so. And the other kind of homework was longer range goals. What kinds of things might you be working on over the next few weeks, next month? What are you trying to get better at in general across your practice? So this is all the interactive supervision journal, and this was all made possible, if we want to think about it positively, by COVID happening. And it turned out to have lots of worth in it, and I'm going to share some of that worth with you. Um, again, I just want to make sure that, you know, my feeling, and many, many, many of you feel the same way, COVID's not 
a good thing and it did not set us up for the best kinds of supervision experience or our students to have the very the best kind of practical experience so there's lots of that that we want to leave behind but these were things that came about from those hour-long conferences and the work with the interactive supervision journal so the first is students presented teaching that mattered to them not just the arranged formal observation but constant and considered cases of teaching that they wanted to learn from so this moves us away from moved our work away from performative kinds of teaching. I'm coming, Johnny's coming in from a formal observation. Here's my lesson plan. I want to do it right because I want, you know, I want the student teacher would want me to be satisfied. And of course, all of that comes up with uh, comes along with the evaluative nature of our work as supervisors. This was more conversational. Um, and I would say dialogic, the idea being that we have conversations about teaching. It's not about performance teaching. The next thing that came up was the talk span time, teaching questions, dilemmas, successes considered repeatedly over time in a developmental fashion rather than, a, than simply in an evaluative fashion, as I've said. Again, dialogic, but the other part of it is that um, it, pushed, it pushed us the way from thinking about teaching as a set of events and kind of teaching as a continuum and everyday practice, things we do and we keep coming back to again and again and again. And I would say that that's a more genuine way to think about teaching, especially for beginning teachers, that they are going to move from their student teaching experience, which is very much about being evaluated for instances and teaching events to the very real teaching they're gonna do in the following year, which is day in and day out over time. Reflection on teaching was built through and through. So it's very much a reflective exercise in consideration of what to share in the journal, prompts to self-assess strengths, challenges, next steps, and in the shared talk of teaching practice between the supervisor and the beginning teacher. So um, I've been thinking a lot the last couple of years about this push towards self-assessment and kinds of agency and assessment. And in this case, with the supervision journal, it did that work too. It allowed the student teacher to say what mattered to them. And in that part, the other piece that comes up in the recent years for me too is as much as we want our student teachers to offer choice to the students they're teaching, what kinds of choice do we offer our student teachers? So in this case, they get to choose the case of teaching that matters to them. The next piece was, I think, I felt it strengthened our relationship um, and with clear focus on developing practice. We were sitting at the same table, we were having the conversation, it was very much about formative growth rather than evaluation. And so I felt that the, our relationship was strengthened, which was so important during that time because we were so distant from each other in real space, but there was still something that held us together well. And the last one, student cases of teaching informed supervisor of themes to consider a cross work in seminar and supervision. This was unexpected. After a few weeks, I started hearing similar stories across my student teachers. And then it told me what I should be doing in seminar, which was virtual, of course, but we had good conversations where I gave good attention to some particular themes along the way. Um, example, especially this time, was just taking on authority. This is a common theme for student teachers, um, especially at that point in the year. They were expected to do much more of the teaching with less handholding from their mentor teachers or from me. And what does it mean to be the teacher at the front or at the side or whatever? to be in charge. And that was something that was a theme that cut across. So I did not want to leave these virtues behind. So I redesigned the seminar and supervision this past year. So didn't want to let it go. So what I did this year is I redesigned our seminar. Uh, student teaching seminars at UCSC are taught by supervisors in our lecture, lecture capacity. We have typically held two seminar sessions through each of our quarters every week two seminar sessions. And one session usually focused on fundamental considerations for teaching, all the things that you do all the time, lesson planning, building community, um, you know, just getting to know kids, but also um, engagement strategies, et cetera. The other session we would meet with students and do exercises, um, role plays, et cetera, to integrate some of those ideas. So. It was a pretty good seminar, um, trying to meld the, the ideas of seminar with the practical concerns of field work. 
So this year, I worked, we worked to organize a student teaching seminar into two parts as well. So one large block every week for about two hours would do that considerations of the fundamentals of teaching. And the second Zoom remote, and I chose to do Zoom even though we didn't have to, just for convenience for the um, student teachers, but it just seemed like, um, yeah, I just want to make it less impactful on terms of time, et cetera, because they have so much to do. And these sessions were usually one hour, sometimes one and a half hours, where small groups of student teachers would meet in lesson study. And the one and a half hour sessions were more awkward than the one hour sessions. The one hour sessions were really worthwhile. And in those sessions, um, half an hour would be devoted to one student teacher, the other half hour to another student teacher, and it was their time from the start to the finish. We did this all three quarters this year, and um, each student teacher would present three times at least through the quarter. So it was an ongoing expectation, not just one-offs. But then uh, obviously um, they were expected to participate and talk and be involved in the cases that were presented by peers. So it wasn't just three presentations and they're done, it was involved. I organized lesson study groups of six or seven students. The bilingual candidates held a session particular to, to their teaching. And as I said, each student presented a case of their teaching at least three times a quarter. And, um, and we have three quarters every year. Um, why lesson study? Um, I've been involved in math education for some time. And I'm gonna say this is a, 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 a version of lesson study. It has lots of virtues of lesson study. There's some things that still need to be worked on as might be understood. We've only done this one year, the things we might do better. But the idea of lesson study, Japanese lesson study, there's some things that matter a lot that we should be holding on to in our own work with our student teachers. One is the idea of continuous improvement. And um, I'll talk about this again in a moment. A, a cycle of inquiry and reflection. Collegiality, at the heart of this is people working as peers to better each other's practice and the use of cases to get better at our teaching. So some of the values I draw from lesson study for this work works from the premise that developing and teaching is a continuous activity that you're not just gonna get good at and you're done. It instills a disposition toward reflective inquiry into one's teaching practice that the way you go about your teaching is to always have something on your shoulder, someone on your shoulder whispering in your ear saying, what can we make of this? How could, might this be better? And that whispering might take you to your next door neighbor teacher and ask those questions too, to get better at your teaching. And the last is holds sustaining productive collegial relationships as an accept, expectation for professional conduct. And this, came, this comes up in some of the other sessions at this um, conference. Um, uh, particularly Evan, Evelyn Young's session, where she talks about undoing the dyad and working to warm our triadic relationships between, or even more so, multiple student teachers supporting each other, and um, the cooperating teacher, mentor teacher being more central to the conversations. So this idea that we teach our student teachers how to work with other teachers to get better at their practice, and we do it intentionally, and it's not just uh, incidental. And so the lesson study protocol, this is how we go about our meetings. The structure of our meetings, the student begins by giving context, setting out part one of their journal, things that are happening along the way. And what's special about this, and I appreciate it so much doing this, is that um, student teachers are getting windows into each other's classrooms and what they're doing, which doesn't necessarily happen any other way. I purposefully put student teachers in bundles at school so they can wander into each other's classrooms, plan and do those things, but we don't often do these things. So this is a window into each other's teaching. Then the student follows by sharing their case of teaching, using artifacts, telling a story with a narrative. I like the, the idea of learning from stories. So the idea that each student teacher is setting out a story of their teaching for us to learn from, I think is very powerful. They share student work, so they'll show um, students' worksheets or other things, um, and then a video of teaching as well. We've been really pushing on the use of video to learn about our own teaching. After that port part, we go back to what the lessons, uh, the supervision journal asks for, which is what are strengths and challenges, what questions are coming up, and the student concludes this portion by setting out questions for the group. 
And you can see examples of, from this particular one, questions that were set out. How can I use the student's excitement and engagement for my lesson? How can I support the students and set clear expectations and intentions at the beginning of the lesson? What can I do to keep myself grounded and calm when I am stressed out and experience technical difficulties that I had not anticipated? And something that's come up in thoughts recently, just this idea that um, student teachers are putting themselves in this vulnerable place. And in this vulnerable place, they're opening themselves up for learning possibilities that they might not have otherwise. So lots of appreciation for this. They're also kind of recognizing that their peers are probably having similar considerations and concerns. So this is a study lesson study protocol, structures the meetings, the questions are for peers. So I back off and one way for me, one way to think about this is I'm another colleague at the table. I'm less the supervisor and the evaluator. Actually, I'm not an evaluator in this case, but I'm listening at the table and I really, really back off. So there's lots of times in these seven, in these sessions where there'll be a pregnant pause and I'm so itching to step in and say the right thing that I've really had to learn how to wait and hear the right thing from the peers instead. And they often go ahead and I'm always surprised. I shouldn't be surprised. They'll say things that I hadn't thought about or say things that we talked about in seminars that really hit the point. As the discussion is going on, I take note, I note the strengths, concerns, areas of focus and next steps for improvement from the presenting student and from peers. And if I make a comment during this time, it's spare on the connections to considerations and seminars and I'll say something, what about such and such? Or and connections across fields, students across students' field experience often comes up. Remember last week when so-and-so said something or another? And it's meant to push the conversation. I will ask questions that push practice consideration for all students. Prior to the close, I read through my notes stating what who made contributions that I noted. And to be honest, um, this is a little weakness on my part. I will do some synth synthesis. I will push some things a little up to the fore. You know, three people said this. Why are we all thinking this together? What's the importance of that? And then at the end, the, the presenting student <clears throat> reflects on the conversation and shares significant learning taken from the conversation and next moves in teaching. <clears throat> so that last part is a concluding thing, essentially, what did the presenting student take away from this exercise? <clears throat> Excuse me. So to make it simple, in essence, for lesson study protocol, Teacher learning that is situated and contextual, focused on development through self-assessment and reflection on the genuine activity of one's everyday teaching. Again, not a performance, but integrated deeply into the everyday work of teaching. And the second bit is teaching lear teacher learning that enlists the care and knowledge of peers in constant dialogue. So those are the essential takeaways from me about why this is a worthwhile practice. So, I'm going to present two videos cases for you. These are my students. Sarika's teaching in an immigrant community in Cupertino, and her concern is in the moment decision making. And um, this is again, she's making herself vulnerable, saying, This is something that's come up for me. I need some help to think about it. And Tina is teaching in a working class community in Live Oak, just outside of Santa Cruz. And her concern is curricular decisions for teaching about pride. Again, she's in a tricky place. She's teaching a topic that she's working to understand how to make it relevant, understandable, and to matter to fourth graders with lots of complications. And I think you'll get a lot out of what both of these good teachers will share with us. Some things for you. I'd like you to consider how the lesson study teacher goes about presenting their teaching, the kinds of questions they set out for peers, how peers build on one another's comments and ideas, and how I, how I enter the conversation or not. And lastly, look for artifacts, pictures of student work, video, narratives of teaching, compliments from peers specific to the teaching, peer comments connecting presented case to own teaching, reference to what has been learned over time, 
comments that refer to topics from seminar and pregnant pauses. You're going to see quite a few of those. So we should get to the videos, and I hope that we get a lot out of them together in our shared collegial consideration of our students' work. Thank you for your attention to these. So I'm going to drop out of this, and I'm going to share um, some video now. And we're doing really well with time. Um, let me get to the video piece that I need. OK. Um, there we are. There's Sarika. Um, do you all see? Uh, did you see Sarika? I'm sorry. I want to make sure you all you're seeing Sarika. OK, so this is Sarika. She's teaching in Cupertino. Um, and I'm just going to play. And I thought about how much I should interrupt, but I'm going to let my students speak for themselves. And then I'm going to pause it after this block and we'll talk a little bit about what we've seen. Thank you all. Part of the factor is Diane getting one thing all together by the sister Diane. Okay, this is where I was like internally freaking out big time. Like this particular time. Can you can you share with us? Can you pause a second? Was there a particular trigger, something that happened? What's going on in your head at this moment? Why do you, why are you getting in that place? Oh, because I feel like things are gonna go out of control. Like I want, like I have, I have like 20, 30 minutes and they're like a few things that have to take place within their time. And, you know, I want kids to have fun and enjoy themselves, definitely. But I feel like sometimes things just get out of control. And, you know, I feel like, um, like this it this is fun but that's okay but this is also enough caveat for things to you know to have this conversation sidetracked and we go out of context and it has happened multiple times before so somebody whose name starts Aaron, Aaron, come over. Okay. Oh, that doesn't matter. That's what his preferred name is Aaron, so we'll stick to that, right? Well, you can see that. So I immediately, I immediately go into defensive mode. I'm like, that doesn't matter. And then it took me a second to calm down and then, you know, logically explain things to the kids. So how do I work in such situations? My mind always kind of goes back to like mindfulness practices and that like you know, and you're good at that. You got your mindfulness practices that you like to do. And so I'd say like tapping into that and like trying to stay as grounded and present as you can. And like, I do notice like the energy kind of builds in that space, um, what I'm seeing and at least in my experience. And I mean, I don't know, it's, it's challenging. It totally is challenging. And I really just want to say, I like feel for you. Um, in that and like it's not fully like in your control which is hard and also my mind's going really fast I'm going to say two points <laughs> setting those expectations at the front and kind of saying like I want this to be fun I really like 
being able to include you all in this lesson and having it be interactive, I think it really brings it all to life. In order for us to be able to do this, and maybe you did this, but kind of setting that out, like in order for this to be successful, because we know we only have this amount of time, we want to make sure that we're very efficient with our time. And so that's going to need us all to be responsible for our behavior and the way that we respond to things and like not like shouting out and like it's a practice of course and so I don't know maybe making that like a regular thing that happens at the beginning of lessons like this where we're like okay like what do we need to do to make sure that we're able to stay on track and not get sidetracked um is a thought that I'm having and then also my second thought is this whole idea of and I'm sure you're good at this like keeping the energy low as a teacher kind of helps them meet you down here rather than they're up here and then you meet them up there and then it gets higher it's kind of like this interesting energy shift that happens so if you're able to stay low and calm um ideally usually that kind of helps the students like realize like okay man we need to bring it down those are my two thoughts for you but um i like what you're doing in this lesson it's super cool that you're like, like teaching fractions like including them and stuff that's really awesome Something that I was talking with my CT about this past or last Friday, um, because there was a moment when like I was feeling defeated in my own class. Um, and she was like, you know, it's totally okay to even just like have just like have them put everything away. Um, and just like silent read for 10 minutes. Giving because like you can't walk away as a teacher. You, um, but that's like a way to work around that. And like, you're just, you just need 10 minutes to think, to so like take your own breather and gather your thoughts. And then also give them time to be like, oh shoot, is she mad at me? Like, oh, did I do something wrong? <laughs> and then you can like reconvene as a class. But I thought that was really beneficial for me in like those moments when um, maybe it seems like things are getting more out of hand than you are wanting them to be. Um, yeah. Just like adding on to just Caitlin and Sarah, I totally feel the same way. Um, and I've had many times where I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. But it's kind of like a reset button at that point. It's like, because you feel frustrated and you don't want to get frustrated at the kids because it's not like they don't know what they're doing. So it's like, you reset, they reset, and my CG has like these routines where they just like find a new spot and just sit down and just relax and take a breath. Or like I had times where I was like, I was just so frustrated where I was like, all right, we're going outside. <laughs> Go outside. Um but also like demanding that right to teach, like Johnny said, it was like, yeah they can talk at certain times and you allow that but it's also like what my strategy is lately is like complimenting the kids that are actually like looking and participating and then they all like get back into check but I for sure relate to you guys Um, I thought those were all excellent points and um, helpful for all of us, at least for me. But uh, what I really loved about the video was like you had them, they were so engaged and so into the activity. It's like you have the control. So at that point, like If you need a second for everyone to step back, I think you could get it because they were so wanting to continue on with the lesson and what was happening. You could even just say like, you know, um, I really want to go to the next person, but I need everyone to be quiet before we do this. Or, you know, like, dim like apologies. It seems I'm a little cursed. Like, that sounds bad, but you know, just setting in line, like, we are having so much fun, but I need this from you before we continue because they, they were all there. I mean, they, it was awesome to see that. And I, I know that feeling of being like, oh my gosh, like you kind of get warm inside, like what, what's happening? I'll let it buffer a little bit. 
So if people want to put any notes or thoughts in chat right now about what they're seeing, um, I do want to get to a little bit more if, if the buffering works. I've had such troubles with, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't enlarge the screen enough. Um, So it is all the students, you might have noticed that I'm not saying much of anything at this moment. Um, and it is the students contributing with each other and sharing with each other um, what they understand. Can you still see the screen? I just want to make sure that, we're, okay. I'm going to try again. We'll see what happens here. It's getting chaotic. Uh, um, and, uh, you in that video have you have them under control like that's like the key i think great job thank you i mean i think all your points are like they really have me think about you know setting expectations in the beginning and you know when things like i really want them to have fun and they do have fun and, 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 you know most of like many of my lessons so I like the illusion, but then that is kind of the energy and so it's kind of, you know, just letting them take a moment. I think, yeah, I mean, thank you. These are like really insightful. I'm going to push on this. That's okay. Um, so a lot of these, it sounds like management a lot. Like how do we make sure our class is going the right way and kids are following us and being with us. And I know all of you are working those things out now. Some of you are moving into solo experiences in the coming weeks, and you really want to have that together for yourself. I'm going to suggest a different thought about this, and I'd like to hear what you think about it. Um, this doubt in the moment, okay? So you've got your lesson, you've been teaching, you do the first two, three parts of the lesson really, really well. You get to the middle of the lesson, and all of a sudden you're not sure what you're doing about what you're supposed to do next, right? Or are you thinking, I've got three more things to do and there's only five minutes left. And these moments like, well, I was supposed to have them here, they're not there yet. Or, you know, I got these materials, I don't, you know, I taught them, I did the modeling, but only half of them get it, what do I do now? So my question for you is just, I mean, this is too big a question. What kinds of resources, what kinds of things do you do when you get in that moment, when you're quite kind of unsure of yourself in the middle of a lesson? What do you do for yourself? I told you it was a big question. I guess recently, because I'm teaching math right now, and it's just a really big growth area for me. If I like, I'll just ask them, like, what do you know about this? And then they tell me and they let me know where we're at and then go from there instead of like me trying to like figure out the answer or like. I don't know. I, I just will like bring it back to them and let them tell me what's happening. Something I've done when I teach whole class and I realize this is <clears throat> we have a table like in the middle of the class. So I kind of have kids move over there when I know like if a specific group doesn't get it. And I try to do a small group. That's something I'm trying to do in most of my lessons. And uh, that has worked. However, if it happens for the entire class, I just say we need to pause and we need to think about something before we think. Okay. So these are some things that came up. I was writing as people were saying things. Um, you got complimented from your peers on having a high. So interest of time, I'm going to pause at this point and skip forward in a moment. But at this point in the conference, I'm going over my notes. And you can see that I was taking notes about what was going on. These concerns, areas for focus were offered by peers strengths as well. You heard the compliments from peers. We talk through the next steps for learning. Set ex setting expectations for, at the front was offered by one of her peers. Um, and then also one of the peers offered keeping in mind how your energy gets taken up by kids. All of these were given by peers along the way. So it wasn't just me suggesting things. These were peers uh, working towards supporting their, supporting Sarika in her teaching. So I'm going to um, 
open it up for just a few minutes now. Any questions or thoughts about what I've just shared? Um, and if you could, let me see if I can get my view right here. I have another bit of casing, which is very, very provocative, interesting, but anybody have a question or a thought they wanna put forward to the group or to me about what you've seen or this protocol? And you can raise hands or you can offer as you need. Someone wrote in the chat, um, how, how do we get a template of this? And I, I, I think I remember you saying, contact you, is that? Is it would be, yes, and we'll also, I'll also make sure that the, I have this um, slideshow in the folder for the conference. I'll and also the other make sure, yeah, and I'll make sure that there's a copy of that, um, the lesson study or the supervision protocol as well. And yeah. the other question I had is, are the seminars part of your supervision or are, is it part of their coursework? Well, that's an interesting question. We, I, it's a blend because I'm both the supervis, supervisor and the instructor. Um, that doesn't mean that it, this couldn't be constructed in other ways um, with whatever lectures or whatever, because this is about taking their lived practice and making it part of their education and seminar. So bringing the practical into the, to the work that we do in our coursework as well. Um, any other thoughts? Because I have the next piece I'm gonna share with you is very, very provocative, very interesting. I think um, you'll find it very worthwhile as well. Anyone else have a thought or question before I move on to sharing a different case? I just had a quick question. Do you, does every student get to engage in getting their lesson evaluated um, or dur throughout the semester, or is it just certain students that get their lessons evaluated in the lesson study? It's every student. So we work by quarters and I've organized it. So essentially in the hour long block that I have once a week, I usually have two or three hours that I do that. And for questions of time, I think of this as part of my supervision. So I'm, I'm, I'm not being concerned about, am I giving too much time? Because this does the same kind of work that would happen if I were doing an informal visit or a formal visit too. So it crosses those boundaries. And I'm good with that because of the worth in it. But um, each student presents three times in the quarter in any hour block. Sarika did the first half hour. Another teacher would have done the second half hour. So it's a one hour block. And so I do those in the week for the number of student teachers I have. So the practical aspects of it, it's just having, having to think about it differently in terms of what supervision and what seminar and thinking about the binding of the two in a way that mm -hmm. makes those connections between practice and field work or seminar topics and field work. I appreciate the question. Um, I'm gonna share with you Tina's case of teaching now. And Tina, was teaching a lesson that she found a struggle in because of the curricular topic. And I'm gonna let Tina speak for herself, but really listen to the dilemmas she's having in presenting a topic that is she calls controversial. So- Highly engaging lesson. They saw let me get to Tina. Tina's about right here. Okay, here we go. The time. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So my plan is um, I might just show my supervision journal and then um, I'm going to walk us through my lesson um, using my PowerPoint. Um, so I have a lot of material since it's been like two weeks, but the one I actually want to focus on, I changed last minute. It came up today um, and today I did a lesson about pride and specifically Harvey Milk. Um, and so this is kind of a controversial topic just because of the, just because it's a sensitive topic for kids. And there's a very fine line of, of a boundary of what not to cross and you know what we're allowed to say and stuff. And my CT allowed me to just take this on. And so it took a lot of just like, 
carefully walking, but um, I think it went really well. Um, so I would be talking about my pride lesson today. So I'm just going to walk us through my lesson. Okay. So I'll put this here. So yesterday we started off by watching a read aloud video about Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay politician in the 70s. And they we just watched the video and ran out of time. So that's all of the knowledge that they had. So there was no discussion really, they just watched the video. And today we were gonna follow up with more of an in-depth conversation discussion along with a worksheet that Micah created. So we first started off by first recognizing and understanding the flag. So I started off just having them read these two quotes and then um, just having a quick think pair share with their partners what these two quotes mean so they could choose either one to talk about but I wanted to really focus on the first one and so I gave them this probably took about five minutes just a quick touch in about some of the things that Harvey Milk stood for and just the idea of hope so before I played the the second video for the day I, I posed this slide which um, included two focus questions I wanted them to keep in mind as they were watching the video. Um, and I this found that this style of exposing the question beforehand and then showing it again really kind of helps them hone in what to focus on. Because a lot of times it's like I play the video, or my first time I remember playing a video like a long time ago in January and then asking the question afterwards. And that's a little harder because then they're just like, oh shoot, like I forgot what the video was about or, you know, so I think this idea of pre-exposing them to the focus question, playing the content and then exposing them again really helps them hone in on that, on what they're gonna be answering. Um, so what I did was I first defined pride um, and just kind of, you know, it's been circulating, it's pride month, like we're celebrating pride. So like, what exactly does pride mean? So that is kind of the focus of my lesson is to really understand Harvey Milk's um, change and activism, but also understanding pride in the lens of a fourth grader. Um, so it's to be especially proud, particularly of one's identity. So the next thing I did was thinking about themselves as you know, students of Green Acres, as a Santa Cruzian, like think about who you are and the things that you're proud of. And so I, you know, shared some things for me. So like being, I don't know if it's showing up. Um, you know, being Asian for me, being a woman, being a dancer, being a daughter um, and sister. And then this last one, teacher, all of them are like, oh, so that was like the last part that I, I put in. I was just like this now this next identity that I feel really proud of is being a teacher. And so like kind of just getting them this, like, you know, into the thing space of like, what are some things about yourself, about your identity that you're super, super proud of? Um, so the worksheets are passed out and then they, they all take a moment to think about some things that they're proud of. So here is some pictures. So on this side here, you see um, the progress flag. And then I just had them write their identities kind of like on each line. So I'll show here. So like some of the students, you know, being proud of being a game lover, a Salvadorian rabbit, Rabbit, lover, rabbit owner artist of two languages of so bilingual. Um, so in a way, it's just kind of like, I'm trying not to take away the, the, you know, you know the, the seriousness of the topic, but also I'm just trying to like cater the conversation that works and fits for the fourth graders. And so this was kind of the way that I feel like I touched on what pride was without going into the you know, murky waters of talking about sexuality and all of that, which is like kind of, it's it's hard because I was constantly checking my my language, my words and making sure that I wasn't saying anything that could have crossed a boundary that could have made some students feel uncomfortable. Um, the video that I showed, I actually had, to, I stopped it halfway because they did say sexuality. And then my CT was like, that's like, we can't, we can't have that word being out. Just, that's just something that you know, they're fourth graders, they're not ready for that word yet. Um, so it's like things like that, that I had to be really cautious about. Um, this was also a great opportunity for, uh, you know, some students in my class are 
they're being more comfortable openly expressing their identities. And so this was a nice way to have them discreetly, you know, draw it out. And at the end, I allowed them to share without having it be too, you know, too much of a focus. It was just like everybody's sharing, everyone's being safe about it and being open. Um, so I'm gonna show you my video. So I heard a lot of amazing thoughts. Let's focus on this first one right here. How will never be silent? What does this mean exactly? Well, Angel, how do you start us off? Let's wait for the respective all our peers. I think you need to like always have open to what you want. Never give up on it. Never give So always have hope for what you want. Never give up on it. Actually, can somebody say I want to add on? Does anybody want to add on? You don't come around. I want to add on that. Um, hopefully, that will be slow at me. Um, it'll be, you know, what you think about will always make her that. So, I like that video kind of like said the opposite of what silence is, and that as long as you have hope, you will always be heard. So, we try to say that's the opposite. So, what does it mean to be heard now? So we're going to look a little, so I want to get the focus on these two questions here and also think about the past activists that we have studied. So can somebody think for a second, who can share with me what are the past social justice activists that we studied in the past couple of months? So just think. think for a second. So think about those two people in particular, and maybe some other people like Nina Sibyl, right? So think about these activists. How are they similar to Harvey Milk? So we're going to actually watch another video. So when, before you guys watch the video, keep these two questions in mind up here. What can we learn about Harvey Milk and his fight for equality? And then the second question, how is Harvey Milk as an activist similar to the ones we already learned about? So I'm just going to... So at this point, she's presented her case of teaching. She's, you saw that she used both um, video and a narrative and the PowerPoint. What she's going to do now is she's going to share a question about her case of teaching. Now, what's curious about this is the question she chose. And later on, you'll see how this conversation evolves into something else. So it's not a static conversation. She may pose a question, but because of the interactions, the way we go about it, the conversation comes alive. So this is what she the question she poses and her peers' response. Share my screen. But um, so that is a lesson where I feel like it was like the end of the school year energy, and you know I got what I could from them. Like obviously they weren't all like completely, you know, quiet and listening, but like it was the best that I can get from them in terms of just engagement and participation. Um, but there was just like a portion of it where I feel like sorry, I'm gonna pull up my supervision journal. Um, for me, I feel like um, when I ask them about like, oh, are there any previous like social justice activists that you guys remember? Um, I know that seemed quick, but in my teaching moment, I was just like, you know, no one's really raising their hands. So I was like, constantly trying to reword the question to elicit a certain response. And I guess my question to everybody is like, has that been an experience for you where the wait time where you feel like, okay, this is me, this may be a moment for my students. I need to give them some wait time to think um, before answering, or do you kind of just like eventually give them the answer? Um, I find myself in that position a lot. Um, sometimes like I'm just such a pacey person when I'm teaching, like I'm, I'm moving and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like it's, it's too quiet for too long. And I, I get very tempted to want to like, you know, give a, a, a little bit of an answer, but um, yeah, I'm just, that's something that I kind of want to focus on in my teaching is just like how much wait time should I, you know, how much is too much wait time before moving on. And then if you don't get in a response, um, do you answer the question for the students? Um, so that's something that I want us to like focus on. But um, yeah. Pregnant pause.
Um, an initial response to your wait time question, also like kind of when I taught the same, or like what taught the same topic, um, a similar question. I was trying to have them connect with like other activists, but it was also after we watched a read aloud. And that's something that I did, like it was slower, like only a couple of people maybe had ideas and I wanted more of them too. And one thing that I did was like um, then start, just say a little bit more on my side to help them think. So like, then I was like, let me give them a little bit more information, but not take away the question from them. So say like, well, for, like, so I'm thinking that Harvey Milk was an activist and a politician and he cared about like people about like gaining equality and rights for the like gay and LGBT community. But we've also learned about people who fought for other communities and like kind of giving that thought process, think aloud time and then more of them raise your hand. And then also something that I use that Julie does a lot <laughs> that I like, it's like saying like, who knows, who has an idea, like as if she's gonna call on someone and wait, like really drawing that out. So like a bunch of kids are raising their hand and like tell the person next to you <laughs> so that she's not just having one person talk. And yeah. I like that it's like, who knows? And people are like, kids are like, I know, like, I know. And I'm going to say it to the whole class. And it's like, we will share out after, but letting them be like, um, that has been helpful. Like, who knows? Have them all raising their hand and then have them talk. <laughs> so that's advice from a peer. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. Um, so that's a question. What comes up in this, in this um, scene is, a change in the question as she starts to realize some things. And this is the part I think that's gonna be most worthwhile for us to think about, so. Since talking about pride is, you know, a very touchy subject in the sense of like, you just don't know what kids are gonna take from it. I'm wondering like, do you guys have any advice on, um, or how has your school or classroom have talked about pride? and? what are some of the successes and then what are some of the like challenges that came up in, you know, in your experience? Daniel. Yes, I really liked your uh, lesson. I was thinking about how my school, like Alianza, I'm at Alianza right now, and my, my uh, school has a whole like um, gay straight alliance and like, they're in elementary school and like when I first found out I was like what are you talking about like me being like a queer identifying person was like what are you talking about doing this with kids like even having them talk about it and me to like discuss it in like very um like informative and like ways that where they can like learn about it um in my class though I'm in a first grade class we don't really talk about it but when we do it's very general but it's still like addressing the topic. It's not like, um, like it doesn't basically beat around the bush. My, my CT will be like, this is what the issue is. A lot of people like kind of what Michael was saying, like there's a lot of communities that are being oppressed in different ways. This is one way that they're being oppressed. That's it. If you don't have any questions, cool. If you do, or if you have negative comments, keep those like the negative comments at least. Like you can think about them, reflect on them, do whatever you need to do, but like, in this classroom, we're gonna like learn about the the injustices that are happening, and I think I want to take that into my teaching. And I like I really appreciated your lesson, uh, and yeah, thank you. I have a few things for you down at the bottom, Tina. So I don't know how useful they all are, but um, this is so do go up to the strengths first. So check for understanding at front end, yeah. make connection to past change agents. Setting focus questions before setting out materials and videos. You, you know to do that now. It's going to be part of your repertoire from now on. Mm -hmm. Using talk, I appreciate it in the, the video itself. You were using talk moves to make the discussion happen. Mm -hmm. So you so notice that as well. So some of the concerns and such, teaching a sensitive topic, pride. Mm -hmm. um, and then you reframe the pride as as your it's like in your identity, mm -hmm. um, as your identity. So um, I'm finding that really complex. Maybe other folks want to think about that. What does it mean to reframe something? And what do you lose along the way? And then what's appropriate to? Anyways, that's really, really complicated, Tina. And I was just like, oh, OK. Because it's like, do you lose stuff along the way? And what's the right thing? And then, of course, the question you asked more than once here, which was a really, really good question, is you know, some kids are new to some ideas. And what about the communities being served? 
Right. What do the, the developmental concerns? You have layers and layers of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You also asked us about to think about wait time, what to do when wait time doesn't work. Um, and then a bigger, big. Let me pause at that moment. What I do at this point is I go through some of the things that are shared. And a difference in this particular sharing in this particular lesson study is the next steps for improvement. We kind of agreed that we don't have we didn't come to a place where there were things like these are the things to do next. We realized it's complex. We need to think about it some more. Um, as was said, there actually ended up being two questions here. The first question that she gave us was very straight up pedagogy question is how do I manage time and in engagement? The second one is curricular. You have a topic that's very, very rich, somewhat controversial to an audience and considering that who's being taught and what it might mean to them. So I'm gonna to go to, um, see if I can get to the right place next. Um, let's start here. Just being aware that students come with different knowledge and experiences and how to manage Sorry. best. And then you raise the concern about which schools have pride flags. And then also, um, and then the other one being very a smart comment was, was just being aware that students come with different knowledge and experiences and how to manage your teaching in that regard too. Um, anybody want to add thoughts to this? These are things that came up that were offered to Tina. I don't know that we've given you anything, Tina, that says this is how you do it. Sometimes we end up very solution focused. But I, what I appreciate is that you just laid out a, a topic that's like, okay, these are things that need to be thought about, need to be addressed. How do we do it? In the, with the students we have and the context in which we teach as well. So. Yeah, I think I got a lot from just this point about, so talking about when I like reframe pride in as part of the identity, I did think about that too, because like part of learning about really complicated history is understanding the depth and the, you know, oftentimes yeah. the tragedies that have happened along the way. And so we did touch on the point where Marvie Hilt, Harvey Milk was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And that point like, really stumped a lot of kids because they were like, oh, like Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and yeah. you know, who's doing something like creative change. Uh -huh. So I think like part of when I reframed it, I think it was it was hard because there was a point where I did want to focus on like sometimes, you know, creating change, like it takes a lot. And, you know, for these two activists, it, it cost them their whole lives, but they still kept going and kept believing. And, you know, so I kind of didn't want to make that connection of like, you know, being who you are right now can, you know, get you like hurt, but we've come a long way since. So that's kind of like the point that I really wanted to, to like express. So I'm wondering, do you guys feel like that was a good point? Or do you feel like, is there something I can also build and add on to that point? I have some thoughts about I don't want to like not like talk too much. No, you no, know, feel free. Uh, I was just thinking like uh what Johnny said about like kind of like with the topic or the point that you also talked about the reframing pride as your identity like you do definitely I think lose a lot of like history a lot of knowledge a lot of this like discourse that you can potentially have in the classroom to like inform students and then also like like kind of what you're saying I really appreciate it though because I've only I'm always thinking about it from the other side but like I really appreciated how you said like you were like being aware and like being conscious of how what if this is students first time like very like under like being exposed to this topic or being you know having to have these conversations but then me on the other end of this like i'm thinking like what about the students that have those thoughts and have those identities like this lesson could have been like oh like they're super proud super happy that to be able to finally express themselves and like be able to like relate and then like you did talk about identity and it is so you you were not like you hit it on the spot but then like you you not you but like less uh what's it called like you know, you have to find a balance of how much you want to lose, how much, what do you want to uh, take, what do you want the students to learn from. But overall, I really like the topic and like you, you know, we're, I thank you for bringing this to us. So let me stop that.
I'm continuing. Sorry about that. So, Sarika wants to continue to talk, but I'll stop that for now. Thank you all. Um, so we have just a few minutes. Nicole, you asked a good question about, um, or a thought about my role. The places where we're sitting as supervisors, again, it's like sitting at the table. Do I come in and, and lord over or say something that gives direction and say this is a way to think about it? Or do I provoke thought? Do I try to get people to get to a place where they can enter into it and offer things? Um, anybody else want to share a thought or so? I know we're running close to the end of the time, but I do appreciate your patience. Um, I just so appreciate my students' wisdom and the opportunity to hear from my own students' wisdom. Any thoughts anybody like to share? Please, I, yeah, um, I really liked what you have built here. And like everyone else has said in the chat that you've really created this family space where people can really push and challenge one another in their thinking about pedagogy. Um, I, I'm wondering, is this something that they record and then they just debrief afterwards? Or is there an opportunity for them to talk about what I would like to teach? Um, and, and is there an increased space for them to talk about their lesson planning? Because I think some of the things that, um, the student might have been able to do better um, in teaching this pride lesson um, could have come from Daniel, who mm -hmm. could have given her really constructive comments about, you know, if you're going to teach a lesson on pride, then let's keep it real. If you're not going to be able to do pride justice, don't do the lesson, that kind of deal, you know, so like having her giving, giving them that increased space to brainstorm, troubleshoot, um, as opposed to like, I've already taught this lesson and now the kids are walking away with thinking, pride is it just about your personal identity. Um, and so then that, you have to be teach that. Well, that's, that's wonderful because um, this is a work in progress and traditional lesson study involves the planning piece as well. Now the fortunate, well, I, it was purposeful. One of, the, one of the people who spoke, the one who spoke about her CT and, and calling all the kids and then raising their hands and such, that was Micah. She teaches next door. She taught the same lesson. They planned that lesson together. So as many of you do, we, I purposefully try to knot our student teachers together in schools where they co-plan. And so this was a co-planned lesson that was built on a, a series of lessons on um, change advocates that both Tina and Micah had taught and designed the lessons together. So it's not, I haven't figured out how to do that well. Eventually, and this is one of the things that's a challenge for this project is how many wheels can you spin before things get off the rails? So I appreciate that part, Evelyn, because if, you, if we're thinking about all of teaching, it's the front end too. What was the planning that was put into it? Appreciate that, Evelyn. Pregnant pause, by the way. We have just a couple minutes. Any other thoughts, questions for me? Um, I just want to say it's upsetting to see student teachers thinking that they're going to be talking about sexuality when they're talking about gay pride and um, not talking about, you know, have, not having the language to say who we choose to love, not using, asking the students to share about their families, parents, their diverse families, it's just so clinical and uh, there's so much fear. And I just think we need to role play with, with our student teachers and have the student teachers role play with each other. I mean, it's just a lost opportunity, especially if the CT is so afraid as well. You know, here's a younger student teacher coming in with a chance to help the, the uh, cooperating teacher, you know, learn too. And then, as you noticed, I, I picked up on that, and that's why I pushed on it a little bit, and Daniel picked up it better than I, I didn't, you know, in my place, I was going, how do I push on this without knocking her down? And then it was nice that Daniel was available to her, a peer who could take her to places that were useful. So I didn't have to. That's another thing about the, this kind of fam family setting, that I don't have to be the one who does everything, especially if others have better knowledge than I do. Any last thoughts or comments for today? 
I, I appreciate your patience with me and, and I hope this was worthwhile for you. A suggestion for you, if anybody's interested in making something like this or engaging in something like this with a student teachers, contact me or we could work through CTERN too. Um, and, you know, this is not in a box and just open it up and here it is. It's something you might co-construct with your supervisor peers or with your students, what might be a model for you that does something similar, that makes that familial kind of reflective collegial talk that we've organized ourselves. The last thing I have for you is um, my peers from UC Santa Cruz, in the next session, we're actually going to be doing this ourselves because we've taken this model and we use it for our own supervisor, supervisory meetings. So in our meetings, we teach Treat, treat each other's peers, a supervisor will come forward with a case of supervision, something that's going on in their supervisory practice. And then we do exactly like we, I showed you here. We talk through it. And in the session we're going to be doing next, we're going to ask some of you to be those peers, because you are our peers, to help us think about a case of teaching. So that's going to be coming next. This is just the commercial. And um, I'm being pumplich. I'm being on time. It's 11 o'clock. I'll stick around for a few minutes. The next sessions, Lisa, start at 11.10. Yes, we have a 10 minute break. So stretch, get some coffee, right. water. It's, it's good we'll to see you in a little bit. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you, Evelyn. So good to see you. So good to see all of you as well. Bye, Bye Johnny. Thank you. Bye. And Evelyn, we'll see you for your session later too. Oh, yes. good, good. Exciting. Yeah. I'm here for a I'm minute. Lisa. He wants to be here for a minute. So thank you, Lisa. Glad it, that went really well. So we'll see everyone in about 10 minutes. Oh, good. Any, anybody want to ask me a question or a thought before you go? Yeah, uh, Johnny, this is Ken Whitty. How are you doing? I'm doing good, fine. Good we'll talk. Erica next. Erica, you'll be next. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> I apologize. Johnny, real quick. It, the, I mean, the topic is really controversial, as you know. What I'm interested in knowing is why didn't uh, the teacher take on the, the subject of the fact that the, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and Milk, one of the things they have in common and a skill set that are the word that we need to emphasize that kids need to know is passion and find out what passion is all about with other people and then find out the passion themselves about the career choice they could get into. Just wanna make that comment. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this. It was, I, you know, I chose this particular case to share with you because it was so rich and it had yep. such, you know, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't pretty. So <laughs> we can learn from things that aren't pretty sometimes. Thank you for that. Yep. Erica, please. Erica, please. Oh, I wanted to, to ask you, do you have a template of the lesson study to share with us or? Absolutely, I'll put it in the folder. Okay, we'll great. The for the session, I'll put, a, I'll put one in there. And then Thank the other you. thing is, if, you're, if you and your peers are interested, you can always reach out to me and we can have a Zoom session. I can talk you through some things if you want, okay? Okay, definitely. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And by the way, I felt like she was really brave to teach that topic. Jesus. <laughs> She's an awesome teacher. She's really good. Yeah. I'm happy to work with her. Thank you. Thank you. Edwina or Allegria? Anything you'd like to share with me? Nicole? From Edwina, just a thank you. Oh. Thank You've been answering my questions. Thank you. Oh, good, good. Thanks for this um, example. Johnny, mm -hmm. I wonder at what point MLK, the topic of MLK in cat classroom stop being called controversial and when will the topic of queer pride uh, stop being called controversial? I mean, it's yeah. it's only brave if and, and controversial and touchy and all that if we don't practice, um, you know, give and, and really normalize it and conversation. Well, that was, I think I may, I don't know if we got that part in, I didn't have that in there. I think it came up later in seminar or something. We talk about um, this idea in this particular case, the whole thing about reframing pride 
how what was stripped away, which was I was which I was trying to push away push on is like, well, what about all the kids who have two moms, two dads, all the considerations of kids, their own identity, sexuality, all those things. When you don't say stuff, you make it not okay. And so that whole null curriculum part. So what things, you know, should be brought in as part of how people live in the world and how did pride become, you know, in this particular case needed to be segmented off from how people live in the world. And that was, you know, it's a t she's wrestling with it as a beginning teacher. And there are going to be other controversial things that come up for teachers about what people think should be taught and not taught. So it was worthwhile. Yeah. I just looked a little like she's starting from scratch. And there are so many resources out there and examples that we as supervisors mm -hmm. can give student teachers of, of students themselves advocating for yeah. Queer pride in their classrooms. And I, I'm at, I had a student come in the first semester in third grade as uh, identifying as a boy and the second semester as a girl. And the whole school got behind it because the principal has a whole gay pride week, or at the time it was called gay pride. And, yeah. um, you know, it made it, it made it safe, you know. So we have Lots of examples out there. And I think it's our responsibility as supervisors to really provide those uh, concrete examples in the form of, you know, links and videos and we articles use, and so we, on. We use, an, we have um, usually a speaker series and such, but we also use Glisten as a lot of useful resources for teachers too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to and another. Have a good one. break. <laughs> Thanks right. for the time. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Kenneth. Lisa, if you're still there, thank you as well.